Okay, I think we are all set to go. Uh, so good evening once again, everyone. Welcome to our second webinar uh, in the series discussing accountability for international crimes committed in the course of the well-known developments following the February 2014 start of the occupation of Crimea. Now, obviously, some time has passed since then. Um, almost a year ago, the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has concluded its preliminary examination in December 2020, noting that several crimes within the court's uh, subject matter jurisdiction may have been committed, such as persecution as a crime against humanity, and forced disappearances, uh, killings of individuals who opposed or were perceived to be opposed to the occupation, torture and other forms of uh, ill treatment of victims, including uh, Crimean Tatars, uh, activists and journalists, also forced conscription of uh, Crimean residents to serve in the armed forces of the Russian Federation, uh, deprivation of fair trial of activists and Crimean Tatars following the extension of uh, the laws of, the, of, of Russia, including legislation on terrorism and uh, extremism. Uh, while the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC concluded that um, criteria to open an investigation into the situation in Ukraine are met, we are uh, still awaiting this step. And of course, other proceedings were initiated in other international judicial fora, uh, for instance, at the International Court of Justice in relation to the Terrorism Financing Convention, and convention on the elimination of all forms of racial uh, discrimination. Uh, and the interstate proceedings at the European Court of Human Rights um, also related to human rights violations in Crimea. Uh, I'm happy that today me and my colleagues, Njana Romashkin, we are joined by excellent speakers with expertise in these topics. Maria Tomok is a Ukrainian human rights activist journalist, researcher, uh, coordinator, and co-founder of the Media Initiative for Human Rights. We are also joined by Irina Bartitska, a head of the Department for International Legal Cooperation and the Prosecutor's Office of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol. Irina has been specializing in sending communications to the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC. I ask all our speakers to limit their presentations to 15 minutes so we can reserve time for a Q&A session. Uh, and of course, the audience is also invited to leave their questions and comments in the Q&A chat box uh, anytime during the presentation. So I think without the further ado, we can start with our first speaker. Maria Tomak, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Um, good uh, evening or good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak um, um, within this um, topic and with this uh, co-panelists. Uh, although I don't think that we have someone from the MFA here now, but still maybe Oksana will join us later um, because the role of uh, MFA is also huge in all these um, things that you are describing. Um, okay, so uh, probably I will not um, spend the time to remind about the background of the conflict and when it started and and so on and so forth. I will just would just state that um, the role of the civil society in the documenting of human rights violations and crimes and in general in the various uh, humanitarian and human rights activities is just huge. Um, and um, it's it's the fact, and it was from the very beginning, basically, of, of, the, of the armed conflict, of the war. Um, and it's um, also relevant uh, for Crimea as well as for the Eastern Ukraine. We will not talk today on Eastern Ukraine, but still it's important to underline. So, um, and I would say that uh, there are several reasons uh, for this um, extensive uh, engagement of the civil society in all the processes. So, first of all, um, uh, we have to understand, of course, that uh, starting from 2014, uh, Ukrainian state uh, just has lost 
the control over the temporal occupied areas. So I'm saying temporal occupied areas as it's defined by the Ukrainian legislation. And therefore, uh, state has no access uh, law enforcement, they have no access, at least like formally and legally, but still um, there are various, um, um, I would say, guerrilla um, initiatives or various civic initiatives that still have access to this territory, at least to some extent. Um, and it's more easy and it's more possible in Crimea than in Donbass. Uh, the, the situation is less harsh there, so it's possible to get some materials, to get testimonies, etc., from Crimea. Uh, also, why the role of CSOs is um, huge is because of the lack of the trust that we need to acknowledge, um, the lack of the trust to the state, I mean, to the Ukrainian state. Uh, there are lots of reasons for that, but I would just say that there is a lack of trust, but on the contrary, we have huge a trust uh, towards um, civil society by the society itself, and especially to volunteers. Right from from the moment of uh, Euromaidan, there was like like this huge um, raise of the trust towards someone who is like represents the civil society organizations, and I would say that it's more or less the same now. Uh, then we have uh, also the interesting thing with the uh, professionalization of um, um, uh, civil society and in parallel of um, state of, of public servants of or law enforcement uh, uh, people from law enforcement i mean functioners um, and i would say that uh, like at least to my observation uh, the this professionalization in humanitarian international humanitarian law started much earlier within civil society right because ukraine has never faced uh, armed conflicts before to all 14 and there were no kind of effectively no professionals no experts in this field and they started to appear within the country into all 14 and it started from the civil society and after that, after a few years, this process has also started within law enforcement because of course this institution, these institutions are huge and you need much more resources and time to um, like to train. And of course the, um, the demands are much more higher um, and the expectations are much more higher from the law enforcement than just from the activists who are yeah. kind of understand this, um, uh, the key things about international uh, humanitarian law. Uh, and also, of course, civil society was much more engaged generally in the situation from the very beginning. It was much more um, empathetic towards what's going on in the uh, occupied areas. And uh, uh, thanks to the um, international uh, humanitarian aid, uh, and various funds and um, uh, European countries and United States, um, uh, CSOs were able to provide, for instance, legal aid to the victims of the human rights violations in the occupied areas. Um, and uh, so these are the reasons why the role of um, uh, civil society organizations uh, is and was uh, quite uh, significant. And now I would like just to briefly say about the maybe particular institutions and how exactly um, uh, non-governmental organizations are taking part in, in the legal processes within these institutions. Uh, first of all, International Criminal Court. So as you might know, Ukraine has not yet ratified the Rome Statute. However, Ukraine has already um, requested the investigation of the ICC um, and there is no way back basically. And uh, most uh, probably this investigation uh, is going to start next year hopefully. So, and um, on the role of the civil society. So, uh, currently we're speaking about, uh, about uh, at least uh, 15 communications uh, that were prepared um, mostly jointly by civil society and the Office of the General Prosecutor, and were filed basically to ICC. And these communications that they are related to 
various crimes committed by the Russian Federation uh, in Crimea. So I'm talking about Crimea, not about Donbass. So 15, it's only on Crimea. Uh, so, and these crimes are related to colonization, to expulsion, expulsion of Ukrainian citizens from Crimea, illegal conscription, persecution of journalists, seizure of uh, private and public property, uh, cultural heritage, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I think that here we have quite an interesting um, cooperation between civil society and the state. And in this situation, I would say that it's quite natural because uh, when it comes to the occupied areas of Ukraine, um, civil society and the state, they are kind of allies. So it's um, quite natural. And I think that uh, this um, cooperation uh, was and is quite productive. Maybe the representative of um, Office of General Prosecutor will, uh, I mean, of the Crimean Prosecutor Office will also complement this um, uh, about this cooperation. Also, it's important to say about the European Court for Human Rights. And of course, here we have tons of um, individual complaints that were filed by a few Ukrainian leading human rights NGOs that, that are specialized in European Court for Human Rights, like UK, Ukrainian House and Human Rights Union, like uh, Regional Center for Human Rights, like Crimea SOS, etc. So, and the estimated number, I was just trying to figure out, to be honest, I was questioning my colleagues, so how many complaints have you filed? So it's about uh, at least uh, 120. So it's at least, so these are several leading human rights NGOs. But of course we have individual lawyers like Evgenia Zakrevska and she's like ultra productive. And she, I think that she herself filed a few dozens of uh, complaints on Crimea only. So, and also it's important to mention, and by the way, I, I have seen that among the uh, our attendees, we have representative of the Ministry of uh, Justice and the role of Ministry of Justice is great uh, in the in preparing the, in preparation of the intergovernmental complaints um, of Ukraine against Russia. And one of those complaints is, as you might know, is dedicated to Crimea, Margarita Sukorenko. She was actively taking part in that process and she could maybe talk more about that but uh, I, I, I would just want to say that uh, to underline that also within preparation of this um, uh, intergovernmental complaints the many testimonies and generally the, the civil society was really engaged in, the, in that process and the role was really also uh, quite significant. So of course we can also um, mention the UN committees, uh, but um, just to be very honest, they have quite a bad reputation among Ukrainian lawyers because um, for obvious reasons, because they're not uh, so responsive uh, probably. And so while today I was talking to one of the lawyers, one of the leading lawyers that deals with Crimean cases, he told me, for instance, that he filed a complaint about uh, the arrest of Ukrainian sailors that took place uh, several years ago. You might remember that case in the Kerch Strait. So, and so far he did not even get a reply, any reply from the UN committee. So that's how it all works. And of course, you cannot get any compensation for, from, for the victims uh, in the committees and uh, their decisions are not binding. So no one is waiting, wasting time uh, for that. But uh, uh, it's important, however, to say that uh, we as civil society cooperate a lot with the UN monitoring mission, um, human rights monitoring mission in Ukraine. And uh, I believe that their role is great um, also because uh, their reports are used by the international courts, including ECHR and ICC. So at least their reports are mentioned in the um, uh, in the rulings or in the in the reports of the uh, prosecutor of the ICC, so and we continue to cooperate with them and, for instance, to provide them information on the victims and to you know to put them in touch with various people uh, who suffered from the occupation. And I think that uh, that it's important. And also, I would like uh, maybe to uh, finish with uh, some instruments that uh, seems to be uh, very important. Um, they are um, quite, I would say, political. 
uh, but uh, they're important in terms of uh, the, uh, so to say, utilizing of the, uh, those um, materials that are gathered by human rights organizations uh, within the documentation process. So I'm talking about the sanctions, for instance, and it's, uh, I think that it's, that's a great instrument uh, when we have the situation when uh, the, uh, the justice uh, or law enforcement, they cannot get access, of course, to the perpetrators, to, to key perpetrators. And um, this is the chance at least to name and shame and to isolate the perpetrators in terms of their possibility to come to some countries that they might want to come. And of course, to use various financial instruments that might that, that is could be painful for, for, for them. So, uh, and uh, that is something that we are doing, um, that we try to do. And uh, for instance, we have filed also, we have filed um, the submission on Crimea um, in uh, December previous year to the US and it was partly successful. And also some of the names appear recently in the list of uh, those designated by the EU uh, also for the uh, human rights violations in Crimea and currently we're preparing the submission which is related to Donbass um, and we hope that it will also be used and those people will be um, under the sanctions. And also um, maybe just something that is um, up uh, for the uh, comments from the law enforcement, but I just would like to mention the um, instrument of universal jurisdiction, uh, just because I believed, I, I mean, I see that this instrument, um, uh, although it's a criminal instrument of the criminal persecution, but it's also a political one. I mean, if you don't have the pressure from the civil society, uh, I see that it's very unlikely that um, the law enforcement will go after some people overseas, like committing some crimes, right? And uh, we had an interesting case just recently in Czech Republic. And to my knowledge, it, it is the single case of um, a conviction of a, a citizen of a third country in relation to the armed conflict in Ukraine. So we had uh, a case when uh, the citizen uh, of Belarus was convicted for um, participation in armed conflict in Eastern, Eastern Ukraine. And uh, these accusations were related to terrorism. I mean, I mean, he was charged with terrorism, but effectively he was essentially, he was convicted for taking part in the armed conflict in Eastern Ukraine. And that makes me think that, um, I mean, uh, we have lots of other people uh, taking part in those uh, events in that armed conflict. Uh, and um, I believe that, that all, they also might be uh, persecuted for, for that, but uh, probably there is no political will. I believe that that might be the, the reason why uh, they're not investigated even by the uh, law enforcement. Um, so probably that's it for now. I'm ready to answer some questions, thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. I think let's uh, jump on our second intervention by Irina, and then we will uh, continue with the Q&A. So Irina, please, the floor is yours now. Hello. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Rezislav for the invitation on this webinar. And uh, this is my first experience of public speaking in English. Uh, that's why, but uh, I will hope that it will be interesting. And uh, today I will tell you about uh, our prosecutor's office of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol, how we uh, investigate war crimes and crimes against humanity, as well as other violations uh, or of human rights and freedoms in the temporarily occupied territory of the Crimean Peninsula. The main task of our prosecutor's office is to record and investigate all these crimes uh, because our main uh, priority is ensuring the inevitability of punishment of those who commit crimes in Crimea. Uh, <clears throat> in June uh, 2014, our prosecutor's office uh, was relocated to the city of Kyiv and in order to optimize and adjust the process of uh, pretrial investigation in accordance with the terms uh, 
uh, norms of international human humanitarian law, we uh, have distributed all our uh, criminal proceedings to the cases, and I will tell you about all, each of them. Uh, the first case is intentional killings. Um, a clear example in this case is uh, the murder of uh, Rishat Ahmedov, whose body was found on March in 2014 uh, with signs of a violent death after a single picket out, uh, uh, outside uh, the Verkhovnarada of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. And our investigation uh, in, it, uh, identified uh, three people involved in this disappearance, notified them the suspicion and declared them internationally wanted. There are also uh, three cases that we have combined. Uh, I will, will explain you why. And uh, they, the cases are uh, prolonged illegal detention, deprivation of the right to a fair trail, and a torture and inhuman treatment. Um, we uh, united them because uh, the policy of the occupiers is aimed in such a way that in most cases, uh, the homes of people in Crimea who disagree uh, with the occupation uh, regime, uh, firstly are invaded by the so-called law enforcement agencies of the Russian Federation. As a result of searches or even without them, uh, persons are illegally detained in places of imprisonment. Uh, they are beaten out of testimony through uh, use uh, the torture and inhuman treatment. And uh, then they are accused of uh, contrived crimes uh, such as terrorism. <clears throat> This example, uh, uh, which uh, they didn't commit, <clears throat> officials do not uh, allow uh, to them lawyers, diplomatic representatives, and uh, do not inform their relatives uh, about their whereabouts, uh, thus depriving them of the right to a fair trial. As a result, people are sentenced under the Russian law to the deprivation of liberty from 10 to 15 years or even uh, longer. <clears throat> uh, this is an example uh, between September 3 and 4 this year, uh, illegal law enforcement agencies uh, searched the residences of Eldar Adamanov, uh, Shavkat Usyinov, Nariman Jalalov, Aziz, and uh, Asan Akhtemov. After, uh, after that, the, the mentioned people were imprisoned, and uh, according to this fact, uh, our law enforcement agencies initiated criminal proceedings. The next case uh, I want to say that uh, about uh, illegal deportation and colonization. There are numerous cases of mass forked, uh, forced uh, displacement of uh, Crimean residences who refused uh, to for supply obtain a Russian citizenship. At first, they were deported to the Russian Federation and uh, from there uh, to Ukraine uh, with a subsequent ban on entering uh, the Russian Federation and including Crimea. As a result, uh, people lose their homes in Crimea and cannot return uh, there. <clears throat> Uh, our uh, Crimean prosecutor's office reported the notices of suspicion to the first three judges who made among uh, 30 and 40 decisions on such explosion. And currently we are working, uh, we are actively working on this case. <clears throat> this case also includes the transfer to, of uh, convicts to serve their sentences in Russia, which is also a war crime according to the Rome Statute. Another case is illegal conscription into the Russian uh, armed force, forces. Uh, as you know, a new conscription, uh, conscription campaign for the armed force of the occupying power has recently begun. Uh, we believe that uh, Crimeans are actually forced uh, to leave the peninsula uh, to avoid illegal um, conscription or criminal prosecution for evading such a service. Uh, also, I want to say to talk about uh, the militarization of children. The occupying power has been teaching Crimean children uh, to hold weapons from the childhood, and uh, this is uh, really sad. And uh, our prosecutor's office has reported the suspicion of two leaders of the um, organization UNARMY and obtained court permission to conduct a special pretrial investigation into one of them. Uh, next case is appropriation uh, of uh, public and private property. Uh, 
they occupy and counter nationalized and raise real estate. Uh, by the decisions of the occupation uh, occupation courts, uh, people are deprived of their property acquired before the occupation of Crimea. More than uh, 3.5 thousand citizens were deprived of their real estate. Um, now the next case uh, is uh, regarding cultural values. Uh, among the objects um, are Hans Palace, Hersenes, Artesan uh, Settlement, and uh, Palace uh, Swellow's Nest. Uh, the case of ecology. Uh, the, uh, the Russian Federation systematically uh, destroys the unique uh, red book flora and uh, recreational potential of the Crimean Peninsula. <clears throat> For example, uh, include the, the restoration of Forest Park, the construction of the Carriage Bridge, bridge uh, the Tavrida Highway, and the illegal extraction of sand from the Sand Cape, and among others. <clears throat> uh, another case is violation of other rights and freedoms, which includes violations of the right to religion and the right to education. Uh, the Ukrainian church is being severely persecuted on the peninsula, and the, also the members of the Hizbut Tahrir Islamic Organization uh, and members of the international religious organization Jehovah's Witnesses are being persecuted uh, on the peninsula. It should be noted that the, our prosecutor's office of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol doesn't ignore any effect of persecution of this uh, of the person by the occupation authorities, uh, the Rosa Federation, and in the pretrial investigation of criminal proceedings records all such offenses. In our work, um, I want to tell that uh, we are actively co uh, cooperate with international institutions and uh, that investigate and consider cases related to crimes committed in the temporarily occupied uh, territories. Uh, during the last two years, we, uh, five communications were sent to the International Criminal Court uh, with uh, the help of non-government or uh, non-governmental uh, organizations, such as the uh, responsibility of officials of the Russian Federation of Forced Displacement uh, as uh, a result of the occupation of Crimea in the context of internal uh, displacement of civilians. Uh, for a large-scale destruction and uh, misappropriation of property, responsibility for forcing the population of Crimea to serve uh, in the uh, Russian armed forces in the context of uh, state policy of military service promotion among children, uh, persecution of journalists, and uh, responsibility of illegal movement of uh, civilians from the temporary uh, territory uh, in respect of uh, persons detained in uh, places of uh, detention. In general, uh, our prosecutor's office <clears throat> uh, has sent 11 communications to the ICC uh, since uh, 2017. In addition, uh, one communication um, on the appropriation and destruction uh, of uh, Crimean cultural heritage uh, sites uh, was prepared and uh, submitted this summer by the Department of Armed Conflict uh, of the Office of the Prosecutor General based on material of our criminal proceedings. Uh, currently, uh, we are working about preparing uh, the communication to the ICC on the facts of uh, violation of the rights of Crimean Tatars. And um, personally, I very much hope that ICC will decide to open a full-fledged investigation into the situation of Ukraine in the nearest future. Our prosecutor's office has established cooperation with non-governmental um, organizations uh, that assist our office um, in gathering evidence for crime and criminal proceedings, uh, conducting various, uh, various investigations and monitorings. It's like Ukrainian, Ukrainian Helsinki, Helsinki Human Rights Union, Regional Center for Human Rights, uh, ZMINA, uh, CRIM SOS, uh, Media Initiative of Human Rights, and uh, greetings uh, to Maria Tomak, with whom I have the honor to speak here today. Um, and to other organizations, um, they help us um, uh, so much because uh, they have uh, contacts with uh, victims, with uh, re their relatives, they can um, uh, collect uh, more information uh, for us uh, in our investigations. In addition, uh, I want to say that uh, we are implementing uh, the latest technologies in our work. Uh, 
uh, last week, um, uh, there was an official presentation of the project uh, of the implementation, the IDOC database investigation and uh, document management system. Mm -hmm. And it will uh, be used to digitize uh, the materials of our criminal proceedings. And uh, this database will uh, allow us to uh, systematize evidence as well as uh, simplify the work between investigator and prosecutor um, in investigating crimes related to the armed conflict. And in the end, um, I like to say that our prosecutor's office is special, is special in a comparison with our other prosecutor's offices of Ukraine, because uh, we need to investigate uh, crimes uh, without access to the territory. Uh, and uh, yes, it is difficult, but it is possible. Uh, and uh, the main thing is to do our work with heart and believe that uh, the time will come and uh, we uh, will jointly deoccupy de de our territory because crime is Ukraine, Crimea. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Thank you, Maria. So we start a Q&A session. And I have a few questions first. Uh, on May uh, 2021, Verkhovna Rada adopted finally the Bill 2689 on amendments to certain legislative acts. Um, and this bill, um, it's regarding international crimes and adopting its uh, crimes into Ukrainian legislations. And I would like to ask firstly, uh, Maria, uh, what do you think? Is it um, bill may um, may have a good perspectives in future for our society, or do you still hesitate about some uh, legal constructions on this bill? Um, so the the I mean I think that this bill is great, and actually civil society has been advocating for this legislation a lot for these amendments. Um, and that was quite a complicated process to push this legislation forward. I don't know why, because, I mean, uh, everyone should be interested in that, right? Because uh, this is the tool that allows Ukrainian law enforcement to effectively investigate the war crimes and crimes against, crimes against humanity. But the sad thing about this law is that it was indeed supported by the parliament, but it has not been yet signed by the president for the unknown reasons. So, and that's, that is the good possibility to like to raise this issue now and uh, <laughs> to ask at least rhetorically this question, why this legislation has not yet been signed. Um, honestly, I don't know what's the reason why the president uh, does not want to sign the, the, the law. So we're not aware of, of that reasons, but it cannot be enforced obviously yeah. No. Yeah, yeah and and it was not vetoed so the president has no has not used the, his right to veto this legislation but it was not signed so it's in the middle of nowhere yeah and it's very um, actually interesting question because it's um totally um agreed with uh, most of governmental institutions of ukraine with most uh, ngos international NGOs of Ukraine, and we're still waiting for, for something. Uh, yes. And I also have another question. Um, do you treat the crimes you investigate as part of crimes within the law of war, humanitarian law? Um, I think this question is probably to Rina. Uh, yes, in accordance, in accordance with national law, we registered crimes uh, under uh, 438 articles of the Criminal Code of Ukraine against violations of the laws and uh, customs of war. Thank you very much. And um, also, I have a private question. Could you please explain how the indictments in the criminal proceedings towards accused individuals are legally enforced? Uh, are the proceedings held within the European, Ukrainian sorry, courts or materials gathered 
are to be submitted to the ICC or other international court. I think um, Maria today already uh, we, we discussed this question that uh, also uh, some cases and some materials were submitted to um, to EU courts for human rights and also we submitted uh, intergovernmental com compliance and we submitted some compliance to UN committee and uh, if this question didn't answer it correct so please ask again <laughs> Uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, I just wanted to maybe to add mm -hmm. just to some general thing about, uh, um, I would say that um, I cannot see any available instrument that Ukraine has not used yet. So maybe some of our listeners can like uh, comment on that, but uh, uh, indeed Ukraine also, we are lucky to, to in the sense that we had like example of Georgia, and they were doing a lot in order to bring Russia to responsibility and Russian officials uh, for the uh, aggression against Georgia of 2008. And many, like, um, in many aspects, this experience was used by Ukraine, but also Ukraine tried to invent something else and to use other instruments. And uh, honestly, I, I don't know what, what, what is not used yet. So everything is, uh, but but the issue is the efficiency, of course, and when can we get the result, um, uh, like uh, the ultimate result, the, the, the occupation of the occupied areas, or at least preliminary, some sort of uh, decision of the international court. Yeah, thank you very much. And also I have another question. Uh, do you believe that Ukraine uh, do all the things rela related to international cooperation of international crimes? It's probably a question to Irina also, or to Maria, I, I don't know. Because we already discussed most of things, but I have a question, so it's better to ask. Uh, when it comes to international, I mean, Again, maybe uh, um, um, it's better when the, represent, the represent, representatives of state are commenting on that question because I might not be aware of everything, mm -hmm. but um, there are indeed lots of debates on this instrument of universal jurisdiction that I mentioned. And it's really a very complicated one. You cannot just very simply easily use it. It, it requires like lots of efforts from various stakeholders. Um, but I think that that is something that um, Ukraine can use more, I would say, right? But it's something uh, extra because we need to do lots of work internally that is some basic work. Um, I mean, the investigation of, of all those crimes, the, the, again, this legislation that you've mentioned that is still not signed even. So we need to put everything in order in that sense. But also it's very interesting when you look at some other instruments, particular ones like uh, Interpol, for instance. Again, maybe Irina can comment on that if, they, if she is aware of that cooperation between or if she is able to comment. But um, as far as I know, there is a huge problem Problem with Interpol because uh, Interpol does not want to accept the cases uh, and to issue worse uh, um, uh, the the um, the wanting like um, the warrant arrests about uh, those people who are engaged in armed conflict. So even though they are committing some. Uh, crimes that are purely criminal, like tortures, for instance, or kidnapping people, uh, still Interpol does, want, does not want to engage in all that. They say, okay, guys, you have to go to ICC with all that armed conflict stuff, but not to, to us. Um, so, and that's what makes uh, things even more complicated because this, actually, this tool might be uh, useful for some particular um, uh, people, for instance, you have uh, lots of um, people in Donbass uh, that are just torturing awfully 
torturing people and they can go to Russian Federation easily and uh, of course they don't face any kind of problems related to their uh, crimes um, and to, theoretically Interpol could be used in that sense but it, it doesn't work like this unfortunately. Yeah, actually, it's a great question. If uh, Irina, you may ask how how Ukraine actually now and how governmental institutions um, cooperate with uh, with international actually institutions uh, on the question of protection, not even a human rights, but the criminal proceedings. How how it's everything is going on? Uh, we we are cooperate with Interpol, Europol. And uh, yes, uh, I, um, I agree that Interpol uh, don't really want to cooperate with us about the team of Crimea, uh, because um, they think that uh, this is a political conflict between Ukraine and Russia. Yes, and uh, this is a problem. Uh, thank you very much. I am moving uh, on to the next question. Uh, from 2018, uh, we, we also had amendments to criminal court, uh, criminal uh, law of Ukraine, and it's amendments regarding enforced disappearance crime. Uh, and I'm interested how we already have a national register and we also have a, a new law uh, on, on the missing people and uh, how um, how right now is this statistic uh, regarding uh, Crimean Tatars and uh, like Crimean people regarding enforced disappearance? Because also today you talked about militarization of uh, of children, and um, as uh, at the register, Ukrainians show that um, connecting with the militarization of children, there are also another crime like. Um, crime against humanity, actually, but enforced uh, disappearance accordingly uh, to our legislation. Can you please comment it? Or oh, probably Maria, you know, from from different NGOs report how, how it's going on right now, because our victims, uh, like the families of uh, of uh, of victims of enforced disappearance they don't uh, receive enough actually support uh, in ukraine at uh, as um, all the victims have to receive accordingly to rome statute um okay uh, the, i can just comment that um because i i'm not dealing precisely with uh, enforced disappearances uh, victims but um uh, there is also a problem with the Ukrainian legislation, with the enforcement of the legislation on enforced disappearances, because uh, the legislation was adopted a few years ago, but um, it just, uh, it's not working properly. So it's not implemented properly, uh, unfortunately. Although, of course, this topic is very um, current and is very uh, tough. And we have lots of people who are missing, especially in Eastern Ukraine, not so much in Crimea, in Eastern Ukraine, there are lots of lots of uh, missing persons. But uh, for some reason, I believe that it's because um, it's not a, it, it, it is not a priority, unfortunately, for the state, as I see it at least. And there is no pressure again from the civil society. Um, I don't want to say that it's the only condition how Ukrainian legislation is working if you have the pressure from civil society. But in this case, I believe that um, not enough, uh, we have not enough engagement of just uh, of active people interested in the implementing of this legislation so that, uh, so that it started to work effectively. I remember even some task forces, some meetings of some working groups within various institutions when this where this issue was discussed like uh, there should be like a special group uh, um, created a special commission in order to look into those cases and to you know but uh, there's a huge problem with that commission because the head of the commission has not been elected so far as far as i know and uh, now this commission is not working so there's a lots of problems with, with that unfortunately as well. 
Uh, there is also, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I totally agree that uh, um, today's law, we have an enforced disappearance. It uh, unfortunately does not work. And it just like um, that legal norm. So we, we really need to, to change it. Uh, and we also have another question of the missing people. How many are found and what can be done to reduce the amount of people missing um, Actually, I think it's a bit of a philosophical question uh, because we have uh, uh, we have our um, national court register, and uh, in this court register, we may check uh, all the cases which are criminal proceedings which are actually opened on the question of enforced disappearance, and we have all the statistics, and uh, there are. Um, a lot of cases which are not documented and uh, I don't know, probably Irina may comment this about the amount of people missing. Uh, the main problem is uh, that we have no access to the territory and uh, we uh, can record and investigate uh, crimes which are happened there. You know? Yeah. Uh but also just to add on, um, the organization called Crimea SOS, they prepare annually, if I'm not mistaken, reports on the situation with missing persons precisely in Crimea, at least according to their information. And, but they track those people whose kidnapping uh, might be related to the occupation, right? So it's not about just some random people missing because you know that people are missing for various reasons and they, they, this may not be related to the occupation. But um, at least, uh, if I'm not mistaken, something like 40 cases are currently tracked in Crimea uh, that are related probably to the, um, to the occupation or to the resistance to the occupation. And mostly these cases uh, took place in the beginning of the occupation. So 2014, 2015, that was the, like the, 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 the majority of those cases took place. Uh, but after that, of course, we had like, the process was, uh, the problem shifted to the political persecution, I would say. So first it was um, kidnappings, uh, they, they, but then they just started as soon as uh, Russia has established its control over Crimea officially. Uh, like I would say that this problem shifted to to the arrest, official arrest. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, one also question. Uh, from our um, attenders. Um, it's also about um, your Maria speech. Uh, if crimes are considered under the law of war, then at, as it was mentioned by Maria Tomok, apart from asking UN agency and not getting an answer, a dispute related to the arrested uh, sailors is currently submitted to the uh, arbitral tribunal under Annex 7 of UNCLOC, by the the law of the sea is applied. Please explain to what extent and what is the line between the application of the law of war and the law of the sea as uh, the law of peace in regarding to events happening because of the Crimea occupation. Um, unfortunately, I cannot comment on those legal like particularities. Uh, it is something that I think could be commented by the MFA because Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine uh, is leading actually this case uh, in the tribunal. And you're absolutely right. This case is currently in the tribunal. But I was just referring to my colleague who just filed this complaint to the UN, UN committee. And uh, I, I'm not sure, maybe there's some kind of contradiction between in, or the, the fact that this case is in the tribunal means automatically that the committee uh, does not have to respond uh, on this complaint. I'm not sure maybe it is, but I'm just saying that uh, um, there's a question with the efficiency of the UN committees comparing to the ECHR. That's why everyone goes to ECHR, not to the UN committees. Um, that's it. Yeah, thank you very much. Rostislav, do you have a question? I have a question probably for both of our speakers. Uh, Irina touched upon the issue of um, hope. 
that the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC will launch uh, the investigation soon. Um, what uh, I rather perceive from uh, how the OTP is communicating uh, situation in Ukraine with the world is uh, that they are arguing with prioritization of cases, uh, reallocation of financial resources, uh, and actually the situation in Georgia was, was also touched upon as an example. Uh, an example some that uh, perhaps see uh, as a notorious example of uh, how investigation shouldn't be opened uh, by the ICC without any uh, tangible result. So uh, I'm wondering uh, how is this perceived um, by the Ukrainian institutions, but also by the civil society in Ukraine, especially since uh, this week the delegation of the general prosecutor has visited the, the office of the prosecutor of the ICC in The Hague. Uh, so I'm wondering what is actually understood by this hope. Uh, yes, uh, really a few uh, days ago, uh, it was a meeting uh, between uh, Karim Khan and uh, Irena Venediktova. And uh, <clears throat> I hope uh, that uh, this uh, meeting uh, will uh, will be successful for us and uh, the investigation will open. Um, I, I, I may add on, on the perspective from civil society that, um, of course, the, I see this major problem that Ukraine has not yet ratified the Rome Statute in terms of uh, our chance that uh, ICC will take uh, Ukrainian case for the investigation because uh, they are not obliged, of course, uh, and they have all the they have various problems currently. Um, first of all, they are overloaded with, with the cases, and they have financial problems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, there is no guarantee, and the fact that Ukraine has not ratified the Rome Statute um, so does not uh, make our chances uh, grow, so to say. Uh, but also when it comes to the to the hope, um, um, uh, I mean, I uh, I do realize that uh, even um, uh, even some arrest warrant from the ICC for let's say Shoigu um, does not uh, may not mean that Crimea will be deoccupied, but I think that it's essential in terms of justice. Um, in terms of capacity of the international court institutions to bring to responsibility someone from the Russian officials. Because uh, I don't think that, um, I mean, I think it's very complicated political question. It's a political question, first of all, as I see it. And um, okay, we're not sure that it's possible, but we're making everything to um, <clears throat> kind of to prove that there's a Russian occupation in both Crimea and Donbass, and uh, Ukraine demands that this fact is recognized and that those responsible are brought to responsibility and, of course, the remedy for, for victims. So, you know, uh, that's something that we just have to do, no matter whether we believe like or, or not. I think that it's just minimum that we're obliged to, to do. That's it. I will perhaps add a following question because uh, uh, Crimean general conflict uh, is uh, cited as a textbook example of hybrid warfare. Uh, and this particularly applies to courtrooms where we do not have only one truth, but we have several truths that needs to be documented by contradicting evidence. Uh, this might be particularly um, a question for Farina, but also for Maria. Um, especially, for instance, with the MH17 trial, the, the opposing party, Russia expressly, uh, is uh, citing alternative evidence, alternative stories. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering how is this perceived also by, uh, by the local prosecutor's offices in, in Ukraine, uh, if we have several truths uh, to be um, assessed and evidence. I guess this question is probably to Rino. Uh, 
uh, yes, uh, can you translate, please, if you can? Yeah, Rostislav, may you please um, a bit short meet? Ah, okay. So uh, it, it, it does happen that uh, in, in trials, and this is an example of the trial that they have in the Netherlands uh, with, the, with the shooting downing of the MH17 flight, uh, that the, the party, Russia namely, is uh, uh, suggesting alternative stories, alternative evidence. And uh, Ukraine is uh, cited as a textbook example, the best example of hybrid warfare. Uh, when uh, also courtrooms, trials are, are used as a weapon of war. Uh, so my question is, how is, how is uh, the judiciary, but also uh, the, the law enforcement, the prosecutor's offices in Ukraine uh, dealing with such a situation that we have uh, contradicting evidence uh, proposed by the opposing party, contradicting stories, uh, alternative stories. Uh, yeah, let's name it fake news. So uh, this is something that is heavily present uh, in the con in the conflict itself. Питання наступне, типу, що буде робити українська сторона у випадку, якщо у нас, ну, скажем, дві сторони нададуть зовсім різні докази однієї справи, або що відбувається, наприклад, коли у нас зараз є інтернет-новини і фейк-новини, тобто, коли одна ситуація транслюється в різні сторони по-різному. Ростислав запитує, як, яка наша думка і що в такому випадку роблять українські органи? Чи можу я відповісти українською, або перекладати? Так, стосовно фейкових новин, так, наша прокуратура також здійснює досудове розслідування відносно журналістів, так званих журналістів, я не знаю навіть, чи можна їх так назвати, які працюють на замовленні Російської Федерації і поширюють в Україні фейкові новини стосовно анексії Криму, стосовно ситуації взагалі, яка відбувається з тимчасовою окупацією. Тому ми боремось з фейковими новинами також. Uh-huh. Um, okay, the question, the answer is uh, uh, following. Ukraine also investigate uh, uh, different uh, fake journalist uh, stories and fake journalist activities. Uh, and uh, prosecutor office uh, also do their best uh, to find these people and to determine all the fake news on some events, uh, but I also um, would like to say from my perspective, as I think as Ukrainian side uh, will, will go on and will deal, um, I think that uh, each country will just present its story and it's uh, on the court's decision actually to make this uh, decision because uh, uh, Ukraine uh, probably as the same as Russia and uh, different European countries, we all have our own truths and our own history. And uh, it's a bit complicated and actually philosophical question. <laughs> what will be the answer? Uh, can I comment also? Um, uh, because that is uh, our pain, of course, because for Ukraine, this problem started not uh, with even not even with Crimea, but with Euromaidan. Um, as you might know, uh, Russia was trying to promote Euromaidan as a fascist uh, revolution. And uh, I was shocked at that point, you know, when we were kind of fighting here for liberal values and we were perceived not everywhere, but by some circles as, you know, and, and we had to justify ourselves all the time, like guys, okay, we're not Nazis, believe me, we're not Nazis. Um, so I, so that's, that's when it all has started uh, very actively. And that is why, you were asking about the hope. So that is why for Ukraine, it's so important even that Ukrainian point of view on this war is supported by international courts and by international community. I mean that the occupation is recognized. So because this is the, the war is also about uh, the, um, the words, 
you know. Uh, and so that is why for Ukraine, it was so important that ACHR recognizes Russia effective control over Crimea. And although it's not the court decision, like ultimate one, but it was like perceived as a huge victory because finally we have this like court recognition. And so that's why we're waiting so much for the um, move of ECHR on Donbass and we expect uh, the uh, relevant uh, like um, assessment or uh, relevant communication from the ECHR in in the next year probably we hope so and of course uh, that that will be the huge event when ECHR will say so what is going on in Donbass is it an effective control or it's something else uh, but of course Ukraine will remain on its current position that uh, this territory is uh, under the temporary occupation of the Russian Federation. Okay, thank you very much, Maria. I think we're slowly running uh, out of time and there is no more questions in the Q&A box. So uh, with this, I thank uh, to both of our speakers uh, we will soon have one more webinar dealing with um, hostilities in eastern Ukraine, in Donbas, and uh, we will follow with a couple of other webinars, uh, one specifically focused on the trial with the MH17 flight, and uh, one webinar specifically dealing with the ICC uh, proceedings in the situation in Ukraine. So thank you very much to our attendees for joining us, and once more, Thank you to our speakers of today. Thank you.